Welcome to Urban Agriculture Field Experiences, Lesson 6 of the Intro to Urban Agriculture, The Importance of Pollinators, offered by the Lehigh County Conservation District with support from the National Association of Conservation Districts, the Ryder Pool Foundation, and the Harry C. Trexler Trust. In the conservation world, it is often said that we owe one in three bites of everything we eat to pollination. However, with the host of associated words such as pollination, cross-pollination, self-pollination, nectar, pollen, and honey, some may find it a little sticky just sorting out the terminology of this important process. During the Lesson 6 PowerPoint introduction, we will try to sort out a few of these basic terms out of the broad overview of pollination and how it can be achieved in urban agriculture settings. Locally, the pollinator that often comes to mind first is the honeybee because it is well loved for its pollination abilities and possibly even more for its production of honey products, including beeswax and honey. Did you know that honey never spoils and edible jars of honey have been found in Egyptian tombs? Alexander the Great is reported to have been preserved in a sarcophagus of honey which allowed for the transport of his body from Macedonia to Egypt where he was buried two years after dying. While honeybees are the most numerous of all of our bee species, this insect is actually known to be an introduced species brought to the U.S. in the colonial times by European farmers who realized the important role they play in crop production. The decline of the bluebird, a cavity nester, is blamed on European honeybees that took over nest spaces after being introduced. Penn State Extension reports that there are nearly 30,000 commercial honeybee beekeepers in the U.S. who collectively manage 2.5 million beehives. This booming industry even involves the mass transportation of beehives stacked high and loaded into tractor trailers that move from farm to farm, particularly among California almond farms, so that pollination work can be done. Our next most numerous bee pollinator is the fuzzy and native bumblebee, which can become coated with pollen on its most effective pollinating hunts. Other native bees that help with pollination include solitary nesters including the mason bee, sweat bee, carpenter bee, and squash bee. And bees are not the only helpful pollinators. This list also includes hummingbirds, hummingbird moths, other moths, butterflies, flies, and beetles. Generally, pollinator species are declining for several different reasons. These include habitat loss, weather and climate change, and mortality due to pathogens, parasites, and pesticides. Scientists estimate that by 2050 the world population will soar toward 9 million and feeding this number of humans will depend even more upon pollinator species. Implementing integrated pest management strategies will continue to be useful in moving toward solutions for sustaining pollinator populations. Lesson PowerPoint Review Lesson 5 Plant Growing Cycles What is pollination? Pollination is when the pollen grains, or the male genetic material from the stamen of the flower, is transferred to the stigma connected to an ovary, or the female part of a flower, in which the plant is fertilized. Upon fertilization, a plant can produce a fruit that will bear seeds, and so continues another important natural cycle that sustainably supports most life on Earth. Pollination of plants can occur in a number of ways. Some plant flowers, like corn, wheat, oats, tomatoes, strawberries, peas, beans, and peppers can pollinate themselves. Known as anemophily, this means that wind can blow in the garden, shaking the flowers on self-pollinating plants, and the pollen will transfer from the male part of the flower to the female part of the same flower and fertilization occurs. In an indoor setting where there might not be as much air movement, students can lightly shake self-pollinating plants or brush electric toothbrushes against flowers to achieve self-pollination. Most plants need cross-pollination for the production of seed-bearing fruit, and this is when wildlife pollinators often play great roles. Here are some examples. Cantherophily is the pollination accomplished by beetles. Cheeropterophily is the pollinating done by a bat. Ornithophily is the pollination done by birds. Entomophily is pollination by an insect, like bees or butterflies. Hydrophily is the pollination within water. And hand pollination, a technique of pollination facilitated by humans. Bees and butterflies come to mind when we think of native pollinators, but let's get more specific. In Pennsylvania, some of our native pollinators include the hummingbird moth, the mason bee, the sweat bee, the bumblebee, the ruby-throated hummingbird, and specific butterflies such as the monarch and swallowtail butterflies. Honeybees are amazing pollinators, though there is some debate over whether or not these bees are native to North America. Though there has been some fossil evidence of honeybees found, it is from thousands of years ago. It is thought that our modern-day honeybee population has descended from the European bees brought more recently in the 1600s by colonial settlers who utilized them for not only their pollination, but for honey as well. Some of our native pollinator bee species include blue orchard mason bees, bumblebees, squash bees, and sweat bees. While honeybees make tasty honey, they are not able to perform the efficient buzz pollination that our native bumblebee can, and they are not as efficient as pollinating as the mason bee. Mason bees can do as much work in one day as 100 honeybees with 97% pollination success. So why are bees so interested in the pollen found in the flower? Pollen contains protein and fat, and so it is an important source of nutrition for worker bees and the other bees back at the hives. Nectar, produced by flowers, provides the immediate energy need for a worker bee. They also take some back to their hive in their stomach, and this will later be converted to honey. Social bee species such as the bumblebee and the honeybee reside in a hive filled with hexagonal shaped cells. 
This unique cell shape organization is the most efficient way to package the liquid honey resource. Mason bees live solitarily, like most other bees native to Pennsylvania, and are more gentle bees that rarely sting because they do not need to protect the hive. Honey is the stored, sweet, energy-rich substance that is produced by bees from nectar. Honey allows bees and colonies to live over winter when it is cold and there is no alternative food resources. Chances are you know someone suffering from seasonal allergies due to plant pollen. Some homeopaths believe that adding a spoonful of local honey to tea can build up pollen immunities in those who suffer from pollen allergies. It is helpful to have a pollinator hotel near any garden or flower bed where pollinators are needed. This structure serves as a home and a resting spot and is filled with natural materials that appeal to pollinators in the wild. Just like a garden, pollinator homes should be situated toward the south to attract more residents. Pollinator watering and feeding stations can also be added to these spaces. Neonicotinoids, an insecticide developed in the last part of the 20th century that has a nicotine-like effect on insects. While originally this pesticide was thought to have little impact on beneficial insects, studies now show that pollen and nectar can absorb this substance and when bees come into contact with it they become confused and often forget where their hive is or where more flowers are and sometimes die. Beekeepers, or apiarists, have been losing up to 40% of their hives in the past several years and with this population on the decline, it is important for more beekeepers to help with the demands of pollination. Some apiarists have their own hives on a property, and some travel from farm to farm managing the hives of other farmers. Some apiarists deliver their hives via tractor-trailer from farm to farm. Entomology is the study of insects, and entomologists research how insect populations grow, how they feed, and the impact they have on living things such as plants, animals, and people. 925,000 insects have been found, but there are still an estimated 2 to 30 million insects altogether. These statistics prove that there will always be questions and therefore always jobs in the field of entomology. During the sixth week of the course, educators can use the vocabulary list and activities provided in Lesson Plan 6, The Importance of Pollinators, to give students a broad background regarding the importance of promoting and protecting pollinators. The outlined honey taste test activity can be a way to introduce students to the vast menu of honey tastes and furthermore, products. Looking at bees up close under a dissecting microscope to examine the head, thorax, abdomen, wings, and hairs or pollen baskets where pollen grains get stuck can be a fun way to appreciate the amazing pollinating machines that these small animals are. Finally, creating a pollinator hotel and small watering and feeding stations can also be a rewarding project when extra help is needed attracting bees to a garden. The following video will give you ideas for a new and repurposed pollinator hotel projects. Hi, my name is Jolie Shylack, and thank you for joining me and the Lehigh County Conservation District for this installment of our Urban Agriculture Curriculum. Right now, uh, we're working on Lesson 6, which is the importance of pollinators, and hopefully you're working with your students a little bit to familiarize them with what a pollinator is. It's an, uh, an animal, usually an insect, that moves pollen from one flower um, to another flower. There are more specifics of that in our lesson, which I'll let you look at. But uh, pollinators are important. Uh, there's no doubt about it. They're responsible for about one in every three bites that we take. Um, and that's not just bites of food. It's also beverages that we consume. So that's a pretty um, important role they play in our lives, especially in a world where we're looking at a population of 9 billion uh, by 2050. We need all the food we can get. And these pollinators are helping us with at least a third of it. So uh, we want to we wanna definitely attract them uh, to our gardens. So what are the most important pollinators in our region? We're here in eastern Pennsylvania, and the, the biggest pollinator is the honeybee, and that's actually the most important pollinator throughout the United States. It's actually non-native uh, that was brought over in the 1600s by European colonists, but it continues to be the blockbuster pollinator. Um, we also have other types of solitary bees, mason bees, uh, sweat bees, carpenter bees. There are uh, bumblebees, which are also um, their, their uh, hive bees as well. Um, but there are lots of insects other than the bees that are helpful in pollinating. Butterflies, moths, beetles, flies, even mosquitoes. People think of mosquitoes as feeding all the time on blood, but that's only the females, and that's when they're needing to lay their eggs. Other than that, um, when other times for them, they visit, they enjoy the nectar the most. And why do they enjoy the nectar? Uh, all these pollinators need it because it provides them with a rich source of energy uh, for all the flying that they have to do. Uh, bees need to visit about 2,000 flowers a day, so you can imagine that um, they need to get a lot of nectar and a lot of water for that matter. 
So those are some of our pollinators. Uh, I neglected to mention that birds, such as hummingbirds, can be helpful and also bats. So pollinator species are on the decline in general. Uh, there are many reasons for this. Some of those reasons include pesticide use um, across crops, habitat loss, disease, and then also climate change is a big one. Some of our large weather events are really wiping out um, certain pollinators. Uh, several years ago, the monarchs were really in um, a big amount of trouble because of all the hurricanes that we were having on the eastern side of the United States. We have to do everything we can to attract them to our areas. Probably one of the first things that we can do is plant flowers that um, are, are good for their food resources. Um, there are all sorts of plants that are, are good for pollinators. Joe pie weed is one, milkweed, black-eyed Susan sunflowers, um, all sorts of uh, so a lot of the blooms that are really bright um, often attract the pollinators because of how they see. Um, so you can plant a pollinator garden in your uh, planting area, but then there are a lot of other things that you can do. Um, we're going to go over a few of those things today. One of them is to make a pollinator watering station. And you can actually start out with, maybe you already even have something like that, and you don't even know it. If you have a bird bath, um, that is a great place for pollinators to get their water. As I mentioned, they do so much flying, um, and it's crucial for them to be able to rehydrate just like it is for us. You can make a watering station, but if you have a bird bath, you've already got a watering station for your pollinators. But the thing is, you really would need to add some things to that bird bath, because if a bee were trying to land um, and, and just landed on the edge, likely it would drown. So it's a good idea if you want to use your bird bath to put in things that the bees can perch on in, inside so that they don't um, fall into the water. So a shell would work, um, large stones and rocks and things like that. This is sort of a miniature pollinator, um, sort of a miniature pollinator bird bath, pollinator bath. And it's really very simple to make, and it doesn't cost much money at all. The things that you need are a bowl and a plate. These came from the dollar store, so you know how much they were. Um, you can also use uh, some rocks that you just gather from around if you want a real, real naturalistic look, or you can get these stones that are um, found in craft stores and dollar stores. And again, shells can be useful. Uh, you also need some sealant, uh, some kind of an all-purpose glue that bonds and is weather resistant. Um, so that is so that we can make our pollinator um, dish connect to the bowl. So let's do that. Let's take a nice kind of line of the sealant glue that's weather resistant. This is actually a sealant used on gutters. So you can imagine that this will withstand the rain. Just put a thin line around. And then simply place your plate on top, try and center it. And it doesn't really take very long for that to stick and seal up. And then we need to put our little bases in that are going to be places where our bees can stand. You don't need to put too, too many in because remember, you want to have enough room for some water to go in there. And we do have our water over here. I don't think we're going to use the shell in this one because it would be too high. But you can use some smaller shells as I did there. Pour our water in. And we've got a great place for the bees to come, just like birds come to a bird bath. Bees and, and other um, insects will come to this. So that's one way to start attracting your pollinators. If you are interested in using these shells, you can even use some of the brighter shells, the red ones, 
Um, and orange ones uh, are very attractive colors for pollinators. The next thing that we can do is actually make a pollinator feeding station. And these are just good for enticing pollinators to the area. Uh, they're clearly just some wire um, with some fruit hanging inside um, that'll smell real good. And you can hang it maybe in locations where the flowers aren't in your garden and sort of attract the pollinators in. Um, it's very, very easy to make. You just need some wire, which I got from the craft store. And take a length of it and use a wire clipper cutter cut that off and then you can just sort of start with a low spiral and think i don't know cornucopia or something like that and kind of make the spiral a little bit bigger toward the top doesn't have to be a work of art. Remember, this is just a base for putting some fruit and then leave some area on the top where you can turn that into a hanger um, to go over whatever you're going to hang it on. It could be any number of things. It could be a branch and a tree, um, you know, so you could loop it uh, or, or just a, a small reinforced sort of loop on the top. So we'll take a slice of fruit and kind of push it in there. And there you go. Quite easy to make. A classroom of kids putting these out um, will certainly be um, making a, a, a feeder that um, would be interesting to pollinators. There are so many types of different pollinator hotels, which you can also use to incorporate uh, into your garden. Um, there are kits we have with special, it's almost like a birdhouse, and then there's an insert um, with some holes in it. And those holes are, are made for the solitary bees, like the base, mason bees. You can certainly buy any number of kits online. But then you can also make pollinator habitats and add them in. And just be careful there. This one was just made with a log and we uh, drilled in some holes. You want to make sure that the holes that you put in your wood um, are a little bit bigger than a quarter of an inch because the solitary bees need to be able to get inside. Uh, so you can, can do that and place these in certain areas of your garden or maybe you'll you have a container that you're going to turn into a big pollinator hotel in our case uh, we actually had a dry, uh, an air conditioning duct and we filled it with all sorts of materials whether that was hay sit, sticks um, logs and all sorts of um, different natural materials uh, that would be good for attracting all sorts of pollinators this is another simple pollinator hotel that can be made with your students out of a terracotta pot. And we just had a small block of wood that again, just like we did in that, we drilled a quarter inch hole and we stuffed it with natural materials. And some of those natural materials were sticks that the students collected and then hay. We could probably use a little more hay in here um, just to kind of hold things in place and one thing that's a good idea is if you can make a, an overhang on your pollinator hotel, um, that will keep the water out of the cells. So adding a few extra sticks out here that kind of look like an awning um, is a fine idea. And then any other little beetles that want to go back and use this, the bees would use this area and the beetles maybe in the back area. The other thing that you can do with your pollinator hotel is you can actually add some chicken wire to the front base of it and the reason you do that is because clearly the um, pollinators are 
are great for our garden, but they're also good for other visitors to the garden like birds. And so if you want to protect your pollinator hotel by f fixing on some chicken wire so that birds can't peck inside and, and that sort of thing, that's an, uh, an okay idea too. And again, this can be hung um, anywhere in your garden or, or placed into a um, structure that you're turning into a pollinator hotel. So one last project that you can do with your students, and this is a particularly good project if you uh, aren't having pollinators come to your garden, your outdoor garden, or if you're, you have an indoor lab and the pollinators aren't there, is making a, uh, a hand pollinator. And so of course this is just pipe cleaner sort of fashioned into a bee, which is just for the human uh, appeal. Uh, you don't have to have it be this way. You can use a paintbrush to pollinate in a classroom um, or just uh, not this uh, pipe cleaner up. And this is useful for tomato plants, which self-pollinate, but they kind of need to be agitated a bit. Each flower needs a little agitation so that the pollen um, drops onto the um, female part, the pistil of the flower. Um, so you can use a um, a little paintbrush or this pipe cleaner to do that um, or outside you can do the same if you want to make it look like a bee you just take a pipe cleaner that is black and one that is yellow or vice versa take the yellow one and or the whichever is the secondary color and wrap it around about halfway like this, kind of like in a spiral. And then you can just very easily bend it over and there you have your bee. Younger students get a kick out of this and then you move from one flower to another flower and things are hopefully going to be pollinated, moving that, those little pollen grains from one flower to the next. So these are some of the, the quick, easy projects that you can do with your class uh, to attract pollinators and to help your pollinators to, or your, pollen, your plants to be pollinated. And hopefully they'll grow wonderful fruit, producing more seeds. And so the cycle goes on. Thank you for joining us today. There are several opportunities to extend the Lesson 6 Importance of Pollinators. Teachers might enjoy asking students to make a case for saving pollinators by holding a poster contest with a pollinator title such as It's All of Your Beeswax or Pollinators of the Bee's Knees. In 2020, the National Conservation District is holding its annual poster contest and the theme is Where Would We Be Without Pollinators? Another option would be to visit a farm with an apiary or have a beekeeper or entomologist join the class for a day. The options are endless. We hope you enjoyed our quick lesson on the intro to urban agriculture, the importance of pollinators. For more information on the Urban Agriculture Field Experiences lesson plan, visit www.lehighconservation.org or follow us on our Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube pages. Thanks for watching, and be sure to check out the rest of the videos in the Urban Agriculture lesson plan series.